Good morning, good morning, good morning, for this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us truly rejoice and be glad in it. For the Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. How many ready to take back what the devil stole from them today? Come on, everybody help me sing this song, say, I'm gonna take Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we thank you for your power and your presence with us on this day. We are grateful for how you continue to just shower down blessings upon us. Now, oh God, this is your preaching time. This is the time when, oh Lord, that you feed our souls. We ask, oh God, that you would just speak to our hearts. 
Move us in a way that we know, oh God, that you are in control. God, I pray that you would use me as your, uh, as your servant, as a preacher for the hour that you would speak through me to your people. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beloved, I invite you to go with me to the text today, which is, comes to us from 1 Samuel. It is chapter 30, and it's verses 1 through 19. Hear ye the word of the Lord. David and his men reached Ziglag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziglag. They had attacked Ziglag and burned it and had taken captive the woman and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been uh, captured, Ahum of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Hamalek, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding army? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor Valley where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat. Part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins, he ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drink any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Carathetes. Some territories belong to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master and I will take you down to them. He led David down and there they were scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away, except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. Y'all, it says David brought everything back. For a time, I would like to preach and teach with this sermon title in mind. I got it back. I got it back. 
If you've ever had anything stolen or taken from you, you can attest to how violating it feels. A multitude of emotions may flood your mind. It could be anger or rage or sadness or distress as you contemplate the audacity of someone to take something that doesn't belong to them. Y'all can go ahead and say amen. They didn't work for it. They didn't pray for it. They didn't even pay for it, but they took it from you. Uh, how dare they do that? Uh, Y'all, it is a violation that may cause you to search for the thief or to deal with the roller coaster of emotions and it prompted you the desire to get your stuff back. Uh, you can imagine that depending on what was taken from you, uh, some of y'all may cry, but others may go ahead and just want to fight some. Somebody, can I get an amen? <laughs> One day, y'all, I was uptown Charlotte playing volleyball with the local league at the recreation center. Some of y'all may even know the center I'm talking about. It's the Carol A. Hefner Gym. I would go there on a weekly basis to play volleyball and practice during the week. And this week wasn't any different from the others. I did the same thing I had always done before I would go into the building, y'all. I would put my personal belongings in the trunk and secure my pocketbook in the same place so that I wouldn't have to keep up with it while I'm in the gym. I felt that everything would be safe in my car. It was always safe before, and I thought there wouldn't be anything different from today. On this particular day, after playing my volleyball game, y'all, I returned to my 2002 Honda Civic. There it is, y'all. Yeah, I love that car, y'all. I, I loved it. That was my that was my first baby. My my 2002 Honda Civic. I went out to the car, but y'all, but unfortunately, around that time, people were breaking into Honda Civics because they said they were easy to break into. But y'all, guess what? I didn't think that was gonna happen to me, but that day it did. I came outside after the game and found that someone had broken into my car, gone into my trunk, stole the things that I thought were secured, my pocketbook, my wallet, my gym bag. Y'all, my driver's license, my bank cards, my social security card. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have had it in my wallet, but I did. And my favorite gold watch was in there and some other clothes and shoes. And y'all, I felt literally violated. I was completely violated and I was mad, y'all. I was hot. How dare someone try to come along and steal the things that I had worked so hard for, break into my car that I had worked so hard for, and to go in and take my belongings. Y'all, so I wanted my stuff back. And I had to pray hard, real hard, that God would help me to get through those days because I was walking around checking wrists and seeing if my watch was on somebody's wrist and I was checking clothes to see if somebody was wearing my clothes. Y'all, I had to pray hard because I was mad. Y'all, in our text for the day, David finds himself dealing with similar emotions as he navigates returning home and finding that the Amalekites had the enemy, uh, enemy tribe had burnt his home down and taken his wives and the 600 men's wives and possessions with them. Y'all know that David and the 600 brothers were angry, y'all. They were hot. <laughs> To give us a fuller connection to the current context, let me explain how David even arrived in Ziglag. Today's text is situated in the Philistine territory after David had killed their mighty warrior Goliath and helped King Saul and his army overtake the Philistines. After the battle with the Philistines, King Saul became jealous of David because he was getting more attention for being a mighty warrior than Saul was. The word on the street was that Saul had slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So David was known as a fierce warrior. Y'all, he was like a brother that no one would want to step to. Uh, Saul's jealousy began to grow in his heart and grew to the point that day by day he formulated a greater desire and plan to kill David. Uh, now after dealing with death threats for many days and many months, uh, David was like, bump this y'all, I'm leaving. 
leaving. I'm tired of this dude chasing me down all over town trying to kill me. I am out of here. So he left the Israelite territory where Saul was and retreated to the land of the Philistines. Y'all, he retreated to enemy territory for safety. Once David arrived, the Philistine king at that time, Akech, welcomed David and gave him the land of Ziglag to inhabit along with his wives, 600 men and their families because he wanted to make the mighty warrior David his servant. The enemy didn't see David as a threat. He saw him as something to capitalize on. And I just want to pin a side note right here. Y'all beware of some enemies that start being nice to you. They just might be trying to use you because of your gifting. Let me keep going. Therefore, David and his crew began to inhabit the land at Ziglag and made it their new home. So in our text today, David and his men are returning to Ziglag from being with the king in Achek when they found their home burnt and their families taken. Y'all, needless to say, David is distraught. David was wrestling many years under the pressure of Saul's jealousy and death threat, and when he thinks he has a break, he is shocked by this, taking on the emotional roller coaster of loss from the raid. Ziglag is burnt, y'all, and David's wives are gone. Y'all, to understand the depth of his loss is to understand the power of his wives. To take the women captive is connected to legacy, y'all, and generational blessing, for it is through the woman, it is through the woman's womb that an heir is birthed into the world, and their heir is to sustain David's generational legacy, and David doesn't have an heir quite yet. The tactic of the enemy wasn't just to steal the wives, y'all. It was to stop the legacy of David's seed, and we understand that David is the one anointed to be the king of Judah, but also in the line of David comes Jesus. The enemy didn't just take the wives, y'all. He wanted to take the legacy. Oh, brothers and sisters, the enemy isn't after your stuff. The enemy is after your anointing, the power of your witness in the earth, and will attempt to take that which will be a blessing in this world. Oh, my God, his plan is bigger than that of the enemy. God's plan is bigger than that of the enemy, though, so we can rejoice. Remember, David was anointed by God as a young boy to be king, and God's promises will never return void. Somebody just needs to shout in the chat right now, the enemy might be on your to coattail, but God's blessings and God's anointing on your life is greater than any enemy that is after you even right now. Remember the promises of God and that God has on your life and know that those promises will not return to you void. Y'all, everything in Ziglag was burnt. All the homes, the vegetation, the trees, all the property were destroyed. And all possessions, the sons, the daughters, the wives, the cattle, y'all, they were taken. Can you imagine leaving for a trip without your family and returning home to your house being burnt and your family has disappeared? This is what happened to them and their immediate reaction, y'all. It was weeping. The scripture says they wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever lost something so great that it caused you to weep so hard that you had no strength left? Y'all, 601 men, 601 men, 601 men were wailing loudly from depths of their soul because of this loss. It said they wept until there was no strength left. And y'all, this wasn't just a, a short little cry. It was a loud belly cry. You know, the type of cry that's loud and uncontrollable coming from the deep, deep recesses of your soul and the loss and the plain. Have you ever cried like this before? 
where no one could console you, no words could make it better, and no pat on the back would fix it, and no hug would stop the pain. You just had to get it out and wail and weep and cry and cry out to the Lord from the depths of your pain. Lord, help me, God. Help me, Jesus. And sometimes you couldn't even say anything at all. All you could do was cry and pray that the Lord understood your tears. And the scripture says they cried until they had no strength left. There was not an indication that it lasted for 30 minutes, y'all, or 15 minutes, or even a day. It said they all wept until they had no strength left. So I imagine it may have been different times for each person. Out of the 601 men, I am sure they all had a different period of weeping and losing strength. That brings me to my first point. When we experience loss of violation, such as something being stolen, weeping, grief, and sorrow are natural responses. And there isn't a timetable to overcome the loss. Healing is based upon the depth of the loss and the process needed to grieve. David and his men return home to an empty, burnt place that was once filled with life with love, familiarity, and legacy. Y'all, we were once free from COVID-19 in 2019 and could walk around without masks, sanitizer, or waiting six feet. We would sing in the choir without the risk of exposure and could worship in the building while greeting our church family and friends whom we longed to see all week long. Now we grieve that. We grieve the loss of intimacy in this way and the amazing worship experience that we felt in the building that is different in a virtual space. We grieve deaths from the virus and the other losses unrelated to the virus, such as the 10 beloved church members who went to be with the Lord in 2020 and the many others in the world that have brought influence in this world, such as Chaswick Bozeman, Cecilia Tice, Cicely Tyson, and John Lewis just to name a few. We grieve the loss of being in school face-to-face -face with teachers and friends. Parents are having to work from home due to kids' virtual learning and kids. Y'all, they just wanna go back to school and be with their friends, but they are stuck at home. We grieve that, they grieve that. For parents who want time alone and are limited in short breaks all at home and around the day and y'all, we grieve the loss of a commute and silence in the car before reaching the office. We grieve for the single people who live alone, grieve connection with others and a simple hug at times. The point is we are all grieving the loss of something that used to be, but no longer is. And when we experience a loss of any kind, y'all, it's okay to grieve. Actually, grief is normal. It's expected. And it's healthy to grieve. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 4 says, There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Grief is setting aside the time to do what you need to do. It is setting aside time to do the normal process of healing from a loss. And there is benefits to grieving in a healthy way. And now I wanna share with you a couple of those benefits from uh, author Leslie Postal, and she highlights some benefits of grief from her resource. She says there's a couple of things that she's learned through her grief process. She says, number one, uh, acceptance of things that she could not change. Two, to make the most of every day. Three, the confidence that she knows that now she can cope with anything that life throws at her. And then not to worry about those trivial things, but to love those around her and to be grateful for every day. Y'all, as we take time to grieve before we move forward into the next thing or feel as if we should be in the next space with our grief, we are allowing space to unpack and process the loss before we move into the next season of our lives. 
We want everyone to hear today that grief process, it is a gift from God so that we can face the loss, feel the feelings, and heal by God's comfort, grace, and strength. Yes, we have the option to stuff the feelings down or to push them away and to try to avoid the pain, but the pain, I want y'all to hear this, the pain will continue to surface and you will have to deal with it eventually. So hear the words Ecclesiastes again, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. God has set aside time for grieving, and therefore it is a holy space where God communes with you and helps you to move through your violation, your anger, your disappointment, your loss, and prepare your heart to continue to serve the Lord faithfully. Whatever your loss is, grief is the path that helps you process the loss and find strength in God as God grieves with you and helps you to heal. So first you all, to get the stuff back, to say that you got it back, you got to start with grief. Then the scripture says in verse 6b, David found strength in the Lord his God. Have you ever been through a loss? And through your grieving process, the strength of the Lord, it just seemed to lift your head a little higher. You don't know how you would get through the loss of a job or the relationship trouble or the death of a loved one. But God gave you supernatural strength to keep pressing forward and comforted you and sustained you throughout every day. Has anyone, I just wonder in the chat or in Facebook land, has anyone out there, have you asked, has anyone asked you how you got through that situation, how you got through COVID-19, how you got through not being able to be in the building, how you got get through continuing to wear your mask or social distancing or, or dealing with what you're dealing with every day, uh, they may have asked you, how did you make it through the divorce? Uh, or how did you make it through the loss? Uh, or how did you make it through the depression? Uh, or how did you make it through the addiction? Uh, or how did you make it out of that? Um, how did you make it through uh, every day uh, dealing with a pandemic or multiple pandemics? Uh, and you can say uh, it was by the power uh, and the strength of an almighty God. It was the Holy Spirit that lifted me. It was the Holy Spirit that allowed me to get out of the bed in the morning. It was the Holy Spirit that helped me to know that you will get through this. Oh, I believe that we have been encouraged by the Lord and the Lord's mercies have come to our rescue. And that's why we are not consumed because God's compassion they never fail. Oh, great is his faithfulness to see us in a low place, to see us in that low place whenever we think that we're going to lose our minds. But God comes to our rescue and says, I am the lifter of your head. Hallelujah. God comes to our rescue and God is our strength. God is the reason why we made it through every situation that we've been through. And can I say it's the faithfulness of God toward David, the one anointed to be king, and to help him navigate the shadows of death by Saul, to come to the enemy territory, to find a safe place uh, only to be raided by another enemy, uh, the Amalekites, uh, to have his items stolen. Uh, but God's faithfulness was still with him. Uh, and I believe that someone out there today, uh, that God's faithfulness is still with you, uh, regardless of what the enemy thought he stole. Uh, God's faithfulness is still bringing you through uh, that situation. Uh, hallelujah. God's faithfulness was still with David. God's anointing was still upon him and was helping him navigate every valley that he was walking through and every fiery dart that was thrown at him. And God is doing the same thing for you. God's faithfulness remembered you when you were in a low
low place, uh, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, walking through the valley of COVID-19, uh, multiple pandemics, uh, poverty and racism, misogyny and sexism, uh, addiction and homelessness, uh, or even divorce. Uh, and God remembered you uh, and heard your cry and lifted your head uh, and helped you navigate through the loss uh, and gave you strength uh, to keep on living, uh, gave you money that showed up out of nowhere to pay your bills, uh, caused people to help you uh, and walk with you uh, and pray with you uh, and be with you through it all. Uh, God caused blessings uh, to rain down from heaven uh, in the nick of time. Uh, God moved some people literally out of the way uh, because God's anointing was on your life. <laughs> I just wonder if there are two or three people that can say that is me, that God remembered me. It is by the strength of the Lord that I made it through the doctor's report. It is by the strength of the Lord that I am standing here right now, that God remembered me in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my job loss. When I thought I was going to lose my mind, God remembered me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God remembered me. Y'all, there is this quote by Wentley Phipps, and it says, it is in the quiet crucible of your personal private sufferings that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation for what you've been through. Hallelujah. I just want to I just want to say that one more time. It is in the quiet crucible. It is in your severe trials of your personal and private suffering. Some things that you're not even going to tell nobody about because it's so personal and it's so private. That your noblest dreams are born. That the amazing gifts that God is birthing in and through your life, they are being born right now. And God's greatest gifts, the greatest gifts that come from God are being given back to you as a compensation, as a repayment for the suffering that you have endured. Hallelujah. In this season of Lent, y'all, I am reminded uh, of the betrayal, the humiliation, the death threats, the denial, the questioning uh, of his identity, the great suffering uh, at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes uh, that Jesus accomplished uh, and established the greatest gift uh, for us all. It is salvation uh, and eternal life by grace uh, through faith. Uh, the suffering didn't prohibit God's will from being accomplished. Uh, it was in spite of it, uh, or it was through it, uh, it was because of it uh, that Jesus found strength in God uh, to keep on pressing forward uh, and to accomplish the plan uh, for his life. Uh, so I just want to encourage somebody today. Uh, it doesn't matter what the situation looks like. Uh, it doesn't matter what the loss is. Uh, it doesn't matter how bad you hurt uh, or the amount of suffering or pain that you are going through. God will still accomplish his purposes through you and in you and birth a new life, a new blessing in this earth. God is birthing legacy in you even right now. Even through the weeping, God is able to give you strength to keep on living. Even though you do not know how you're going to get it through, God is going to make something beautiful out of your pain. When you are strengthened by the Lord, God will carry you through the loss. Wipe your tears away. Lift your head. Restore your hope. Restore your joy. And your mind will be kept. God is going to give you compensation for what you've been through. And I just wonder if there's someone out there that is as happy as I am that we ain't going through this for no reason. But God is birthing something new, uh, and God is going to compensate you uh, according to God's anointing on your life, uh, even right now. Hallelujah, and thanks be to God. So then we think about the weeping he had to go through, and then he was strengthened by the Lord. And then the next thing is that David went to God in prayer. 
this type prayer. After God gave David strength, David prepared to pursue what was taken by going to God in prayer, y'all. David called on the priests to bring him what they say is the ephod. Now, the ephod is described in Exodus 39, 1 through 21, and it was a part of the priestly garment that the Lord commanded the priests to wear. The ephod was a vest that was worn over the outer clothing. It was a beautiful gold and blue and purple vest, scarlet linen-like garment that was accompanied by the breastplate that contained the Urim and the Thummim. It is noted in Scripture that the priest Aaron kept the Urim and the Thummim over his heart to help him make decisions. This was the practice of the priest when praying to God. The priest would make decisions and determine God's will by using these stones. The Urim, which was white and is a symbolic of curses, guilt, or uh, fault, which is a no. And the Thummim was the black stone, symbolizing perfection or light or truth or innocence or yes. So what happened was the priest was called because David was going to God in prayer. And the priest would re reach down into the pocket where these stones were. And based upon the one that the priest pulled out was the answer from God. So in essence, when David called the priest to bring the ephod, his heart was prepared to seek the Lord in his situation so that he could align himself with the will of the God. Because he knew, y'all, if God said it, then it would come to pass. Y'all, as we have been through all sorts of situations in 2021, 2020, and even going back to 2019, we must inquire of the Lord and see what God has to say about these things. We have to think about what does God have to say about worship and ministry in 2021 and beyond. It might be beyond what we think it's going to look like. What does God have to say about this pandemic? What does God have to say about your career, your marriage, your money? What does God have to say about what you lost or the things that concern you? You fill in the blank. What does God have to say? When David inquired of the Lord, he prayed a specific prayer. And I think that there is a blessing or there is understanding or, or there is knowledge in praying a specific prayer. He said, shall I pursue this raiding army? That's a yes or no question. Or will I overtake them? That's yes or no too. In the essence, he said, should I go after my stuff and will I get it back? And according to the discernment of the priest using these stones, the priest reached into the ephod that he was wearing and he pulled out the thummim, which meant yes, because the scripture says the Lord told him, go after them and David would get back everything. As children of the new covenant through Jesus Christ, we have an advocate with the Father and an intercessor in Christ. And at all times, my brothers and sisters, we are called to offer our prayers and petitions to God, making our requests known. And we should pray about everything, pray specific prayers, and seek the discernment of the Lord so that we know how to move forward through prayer. So pray is the next thing. We got to agree, we find strength, and then we pray. And then lastly, it says he followed God's will by being obedient to go first. So how are we to follow God's will? Number one, as I said, be obedient. Yo, God, David didn't know exactly where the Amalekites were located. He only knew the vicinity. But David set out to find them find out because of his obedience to God's word given in prayer. And I believe he also knew God would direct him as he went. When we are discerning God's will, our obedience to go is the first step. Y'all, God may not tell us the whole step, the whole way to get there, but God may give us that first nudge and say, go here or just go. And then we have to move according to what we know to do, moving forward with the plan, the vision, or call, even when we don't fully know the extent of the journey ahead. We know as we go that God will lead us the whole way. So we go. And then we realize that God is going to lead us. That brings me to my second point. God 
will direct as you go. As David went to find the Amalekites, he came in contact with an Amalekite slave after about a 44-mile walk. Y'all, that's a long ways. That's almost two marathons. I thought about that thing, and I was like, woo, I would probably be tired too, like those 200. But when you determine to do something, there is some sort of tenacity and strength that just wells up inside of you. So he walked his 44 miles out from Ziglag, which would have taken him about 14 hours, y'all, and 40 minutes. I worked that thing out. This man, this man knew where the Amalekites were, the ones that he, they found on the way. And it wasn't by coincidence that David found the man whenever he stopped to rest 200 dropped off, and then the 400, one of the 400, found this man that was sitting in this place almost ready to die, said. He was hungry. And not only did they rescue him and feed him, but the man blessed David by leading him to the exact place where he could get his possessions back. Hear me, y'all. Don't discount the people God brings into your life along the way. The very person who you may look at as if they may not be able to bless you, maybe the ones that can actually bless you. Because he, they didn't only bless this man, but he was also a blessing to him. So as you move forward into your calling or to accomplish the plan that God has for your life, pay attention to the people that God places in your path that may be the direction that God exactly wants you to follow. Then number three, it will take endurance for the journey, and some won't be able to endure the journey ahead. As David traveled and arrived at Besor Valley, which um, was, again, the 44 miles ahead, y'all see in the story that 200 of them couldn't even make it. It was the 400 other men that were able to make the journey to the Malachite territory. Y'all, there will be some people who will start the journey with you. And I don't know what your journey is. That's between you and Jesus. But it could be connected to the church, uh, working in the church or outside the church. But it is your call. There are some people that won't make that journey with you. They might start out with you in the business, but they won't fulfill the fullness of that business. And they're not meant to. So the point is, you got to keep going. Some won't have the endurance, the stamina, or the perseverance to move through whatever the hard thing is. For them, it was the journey to the place, but there may be opposition that you find in certain spaces. It can be in the church or it can be outside the church. Some people won't be able to endure it, but there will be more that will be able to endure than won't. Y'all hold on to that word because God's saying something right there. So don't worry about who can endure. Stay focused on what God told you to do, and then it will come to fruition. Then number four, you will contend with the enemy, but always remember the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Y'all, this right here is what I was about to shout because I looked at that text and I said, Ward, you just showed me something I ain't seen before. When David arrived at the enemy camp, the scripture says he fought them from dusk until evening the following day. And not one of them who engaged in the battle got away uh, except y'all. 400 rode off on camel and they got away. But guess what? The ones who fought... They didn't get away. They were destroyed. The ones who didn't even engage in the fight were the ones who got away. Y'all remember that the fight is fixed. Hallelujah. That might be somebody's shouting point right there. Remember that the fight is fixed. Uh, anyone who engages in battle with the Lord will always lose uh, because God wins every battle. Uh, the promises of God overrides the enemy's tactics. So when the enemy uh, is trying to come up against you, uh, as long as you are aligned with the will of God, as long as you align with what God told you, uh, the battle is fixed. Uh, the fight is fixed in your favor because God always wins. Hallelujah. So trust God in the battle and know that God fights for you. 
Then number five, you will accomplish everything God said you would. It's in the text, y'all. It was according to God's promise in prayer that David would receive everything back. And verse 18 says, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, according, including his two wives. They pointed that out, including his legacy, including his legacy. Y'all think that some of this stuff that we're going through right now is stopping what God has already promised you? The scripture says that you will not be stopped because God said that you will would get it all back. Uh, nothing was missing, it said, y'all. Young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else uh, they had taken. Uh, David brought everything back. Uh, oh, brothers and sisters, God's word and promises towards you will always uh, come to pass. Uh, now, David was said that he would get it all back, uh, but whatever God has promised you, uh, that is according to God's promise to you. Uh, you will get that thing back. Uh, I just want to shout right now, y'all. Y'all just don't feel the spirit of the Lord in this place. Uh, God is promising someone uh, that you need to hold on to every word that God has already told you uh, because it will come to pass. Uh, you may not be able to see it right now, but God said it will come to pass. Uh, well, y'all, let me just hurry on and close uh, because I feel my help coming on uh, and I just believe uh, that God is going to bless someone even right now. Uh, y'all, as I close, I just want to share the story about how my story turned out when the thief tried to come in and steal my stuff. Well, seven days after my car was broken into, y'all, I got a phone call from the police station, and they said someone was walking in uptown Charlotte and saw my driver's license under a bridge, picked it up and brought it to the station. Now, y'all, what are the odds that someone in Charlotte, North Carolina, is going to be walking and see my license under the bridge, pick it up and take it to the police station. Well, they called me to say that I could pick up my license at my leisure. And y'all, all my searching didn't recover anything that had been stolen from me. But God saw fit to command someone to see me. And God may be commanding some angels to cons concerning you even right now. Well, y'all, I picked it up and delivered my license from the police station. And it was exactly what I needed to get my identity back. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Because because I needed my license to get my social security card, a new card, a new bank card. God gave me back not all that I had lost, but that which I needed. And I just believe I'm preaching to someone today that you may not have got it all back, but God has given you back everything that you need. It's coming back. It's coming back. It's coming back to you. Your hope is coming back. Your peace is coming back. Your joy. Your marriage is coming back. Uh, your friendships, your children, they all coming back. Uh, your job is coming back. Uh, your love is coming back. Uh, your joy is coming back. Uh, your self-esteem is coming back. Uh, because Jesus uh, died on the cross for you and for me. Uh, and we getting it all back. Hallelujah. Whatever it is. Uh, and I can't. And whatever it is that God has promised you, uh, you are getting it back. Uh, and the devil can't stop it. Nobody can stop it. You are getting it back. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We are grateful. Hallelujah. I just think we need to praise the Lord just a little bit. Thank you, God, for allowing me to get it back. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing in my life. Thank you, God, for how you kept me from danger seen and unseen. Thank you, Lord, for how you blessed me despite myself. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping me through this and keeping me through that. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you have been stored on my life. Uh, thank you, God, for keeping my mind. Uh, thank you, even though I lost a loved one, God, uh, you comforted me. Uh, praise be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for bringing it all back. The glory. We are grateful that you have joined with us today. Thank you for uh, worshiping with us, and we pray that you have an amazing week, and we'll see you back next weekend. God bless you.